All right, guys, back here on the Fox 5 Live Zone. Once again, a live look just outside of the Key Bridge in Baltimore. You are looking at the press corps awaiting the arrival of President Biden. We are told that the motorcade has actually arrived. Uh, the president apparently meeting with other folks before he addresses the meeting, of which we are anticipating that should happen momentarily. We can also make mention that we saw several Secret Service members uh, walking about, and so we would expect once again that the president uh, and Maryland Governor Wes Moore will be addressing the meeting. Of. When that happens, we will make sure we get that to you live right here on the Live Zone. In the meantime, if you take a peek at the calendar, what do you realize? Yes, it is tax season, and with tax season means Oh my gosh, a lot of stress. Apparently, a lot of us aren't filing in time. Why? Well, it's a psychological issue. Let's take a look. With the deadline to file your taxes quickly approaching, psychologists are analyzing the findings of a new study, revealing that people whose behavior tends to be guided by their negative attitudes usually delay completing tasks they find unpleasant, like their taxes. Those for whom negative attitudes tended to generalize more strongly seem to be the kind of people that delay <laughs> filing their taxes. Russell Fazio of The Ohio State University says people are faced with a process called valence waiting bias. It describes the tendency of people to tap more into either a positive or negative mindset when faced with new or tedious responsibilities. We find that people with a negative valence waiting bias are more cautious. Researchers found those who lean more into their negative thoughts when deciding to file their taxes early wound up procrastinating, even if there was a benefit of receiving a tax refund. It could have been something that had been done, say, over the course of a few days, maybe even a week, but now it's got to be done in a rush fashion. But having a negative waiting bias is not always a bad thing. When it comes to preparing for a test, for instance, researchers say these types of people are usually more realistic about how they will perform, while people with a positive weighting bias can be overconfident and generate a false sense of security. Gary Baumgarten, Fox News. I wish I could say I feel better after hearing that report, but quite honestly, I'm, I still haven't filed yet, Caitlin. Well, you got time. I mean, it, it, we got 10 days. That's an eternity, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I know what I'm going to be doing this weekend. Yeah, well, you know what? With the weather like this outside, you might as well stay in and do your taxes. You're not missing anything, right? <laughs> but finally, though, I saw yeah. some sunshine today. Just I know. a peak of it. A peak of it. Just like yesterday, we saw a peak of it. Same thing today. Uh, it'll be the same thing Saturday. By Sunday, I think we finally turn a corner from what wow. has been a really wet and chilly week. I yeah. mean, such a start to spring that it has not been spring-like at all. Cold too. And cold, cold. Gosh. I, right? I think even more so than wet, it has just been cold. Yeah. And it is not usually this chilly in early April. So mm. we're ready to turn things around. And uh, we'll start that off for you with your forecast. More sun by Sunday. So it does look uh, much nicer, like bright blue sky the whole day. Because even right now, as I'm saying this, we've got showers uh, dropping in from the north. So we're already dealing with another round of rain today. Uh, mostly cloudy at Dulles, Reagan, and BWI right now. You see temperatures are in the 50s. We've made it up to 57 here in D.C., but it's a very chilly uh, 51 up in Baltimore where there is a little bit of light rain swinging through the city. This should not be the level of downpours that we saw yesterday afternoon. I mean, there were reports of hail widespread. So uh, these look to me, at least right now, just kind of pretty minor showers, but a little rain for you to kind of get through the late afternoon hours. And then by tomorrow, low pressure starts to pull away. We're still mostly cloudy. We're still chilly. But by Sunday, things greatly improve. And I think we have mostly sunny skies, less wind. And while temperatures are not super warm, we're at least cracking into the 60s. And I think just having the sun out all day guy mm. will be you know we talked about psychological impacts with your taxes sure. psychological impacts with the weather after a week of mostly cloudy skies it's nice to finally get that full vitamin d so speaking of that solar eclipse on monday obviously you'll be uh dealing with it here on your yep. show and it's all about the sky cover how many clouds we have out there because the more cloudiness you have the harder it will be to to view the full eclipse so um right now we're in D.C. The I think it starts around 2 o'clock mm -hmm. and then we kind of peak around 3. Mike Thomas is going to be up in Buffalo, New York, and it peaks for him at 320, the actual point of totality. It's a few minutes. So sky cover to start looks great here. 
It looks a little hazy up in Buffalo, but then it looks better in Buffalo as they get closer to three o'clock. So this would actually be ideal, partly cloudy to mostly sunny skies, both here and in Buffalo. So where Mike is in the point of totality, I'm really hoping uh, on both uh, your show guy and on the DMV zone when we take it at 320, we got a good oh, that's gonna be shot awesome. of, it, of yeah. it. Yeah, of it being totally dark. And then here in DC, we will also see it. It won't be as intense. It won't even be as close, but uh, we'll, we should hopefully still get some decent visibility with it. So when talking about the solar eclipse um, and viewing conditions, the farther north and east you go in the path of totality, the better. So it should be great. Burlington and Cleveland, uh, still pretty good. Buffalo, D.C., Indianapolis, and then down to the south for anyone in Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas, it's going to be a little bit harder to see. Yeah. So, you know, I think of all the folks that are in Texas, in Oklahoma, it's like this once in a lifetime experience. But if it's totally cloudy, you'd never know it was happening. Oh my gosh. Isn't that weird? It's, it's like, miss out. you would just totally miss out, but there's nothing you can do. The clouds, if it's like it was on Wednesday here with the fog and rain and low clouds, you just, you wouldn't, you would have no idea what's mm. happening. So anyways, that's a seven day, which by the way, shows temperatures in the seventies by next week. <laughs> I know, finally improving. So uh, I think we will really turn a corner by Sunday and hopefully not go back to anything this chilly, this prolonged. With for regard a while. to the uh, total solar eclipse, I'm envisioning it kind of like being at the pool. You're yes. lying out, and yes. all of a sudden the, the clouds. And you know, you kind of have yes. your eyes closed, and it gets dark really quick. Yes, is that, that is what I should such, expect? Yes, that is such a good comparison. I totally agree. Mm. I think that that's exactly what it's like. And and you know, when the cloud goes over the sun, all of a sudden sometimes you get a little cool, yep. right? Because you're trying to get your tan on at the beach or the pool, yep. and then all of a sudden it's like, who blocked my sun? <laughs> so that's very similar to what it's like. That's definitely what it's going to be like here. In the path of totality, it might almost feel more like the sun has set. Wow. So that is what, that's why they say you got to get to the path of totality. It's just so much more significant than even being where we are at 87%. Yeah. And once again, our own Mike Thomas going to be live be from there. Buffalo. And, and, and what an assignment. How cool is that? Yeah. I mean, he was in, so this is Mike's second total solar eclipse. Okay. In 2017, he went to South Carolina and he was in the path of totality. And he said it was amazing. And the other thing that kind of happens, he said it was like a partly sunny kind of day. He was worried about the cloud cover. But a lot of the times when the eclipse starts, which is like an hour before you peak, um, the clouds kind of all dissipate. And wow. thin out. So there is that effect sometimes with it. So we'll see if that happens again for him. But yeah, so he's in the sweet spot, but we'll we'll have our glasses on and be out on the sky yeah. deck too. Good here. point. Make sure you wear your glasses. Yes, yeah. I know. So, hey, forget watching a movie. You can watch us on Monday. We're going to have all the suspense, all yes. the drama, and everything else surrounding that right here in the LZ. Always good to see you, Caitlin. Great Thank to you see so you much. Too, guy. Of course, have a great weekend. I know we'll a lot been going on this week. Uh, every week is so long. I'll tell you. <laughs> But it's a good thing. Yeah. We'll take a break and be right back. processing unit uh, in the United States, about 15% of all autos come through here in the Baltimore. And all the heavy equipment, I mean farm equipment, big construction equipment comes through here. Over 30% of that comes through basically stop traffic from something much worse. They went, went out. All right, guys, you're back here on the Fox 5 Live Zone. We wanted to take you to this directly. President Biden and Governor Westmore, as you can see beside him, now in the city of Baltimore, 
We are awaiting the president to address the media surrounding all things with regard to the collapse of the key bridge. He is now getting an assessment of the lay of the land, if you will, as to what currently stands. I want to make mention that some $200 million in cargo moves through Baltimore port on a daily basis. It appears as if he is currently being addressed about this. Let's take a listen in to find out exactly what's going on. With cranes, with barges, with men. They knew how to do this, and then working through Unified Command, they've been basically opening those smaller channels. So they've been doing that. We, we will continue to work with uh, our partners on the outside. We have trade which is just outside of the impacted area, in effect, both to stage where we're going to put salvage, but also to try to get more jobs and keep things flowing through the port until it's totally open. The $60 million that we got through emergency relief is what's funding all that. So those openings that you saw earlier that was just pointed out, that was done with that $60 million. The traffic issues that we're dealing with was that $60 million. So thank you so much. We could not have gotten onto this as quickly as we did without that $60 million. In terms of rebuilding, we're working very closely with the Federal Highway Administration. Basically, now how do we get this done as quickly as we can, and environmentally as we can, to deal with the, the, the new standards that we'll have to meet with this, Let's get all that front lined up now so that we can get this thing open as quickly as we can because we've got to serve those people that work here at the port and the region as a whole. With that, I'll turn it over to the Secretary Buttigieg. Thanks, Paul. So, Mr. President, on day one, you directed us to do everything possible to support the state of Maryland from a DOT perspective. That has mainly meant supporting the Maryland DOT on four lines of effort. Help them get the port back open, deal with the supply chain implications in the meantime, help them get the bridge back up and deal with the surface traffic implications in the meantime. As Paul mentioned, the $60 million was the first wave of emergency relief funding. We were able to turn that around within hours of it coming in. That is a down payment and just the beginning, but as more requests come in, we'll make sure that we can turn them around right away too. When it comes to supply chains, a number of the mechanisms that you established to deal with the issues we had in 2021 on the West Coast are serving us well now on the East Coast. Uh, as you know, this is the top vehicle handling port uh, that we have in the United States. Uh, the ports of Davisville, Rhode Island, uh, as well as uh, Virginia and Brunswick in Georgia have been able to uh, temporarily absorb much of the traffic that would have been headed uh, for Baltimore. Uh, but there's no long-term substitute, of course, uh, for the work that's done right here in Baltimore. When it comes to containers, most of that's getting picked up at the Port of Virginia in New York and New Jersey. Uh, and then when it comes to heavy equipment, there's some specialized ports absorbing that traffic too. Uh, but the focus is, of course, to support Baltimore and make sure they can get back up and running. Yesterday, we were able to execute a revised grant agreement from our maritime administration with the county of Baltimore. That relates to the Sparrows Point uh, Trade Point facility. You'll notice this is the only major component of the Port of Baltimore that sits outside of the block area. They have 10,000 vehicle per month capacity. We're gonna be able to help them get up to 20,000. Basically, it requires paving about 10 acres of land here uh, to add to their cargo lay down capacity. Uh, so by doubling that, we'll be able to provide some relief uh, while uh, uh, the Army Corps and the uh, state are getting the channel back open and uh, traffic back to normal. We're also providing some regulatory relief on the trucking side to uh, help with hours of service requirements for trucks that are involved in the response. and. Uh, any other requests to come in? Sir, I'd like to meet some of the great first responders that came on day one and were just a tremendous sir.
Guys, if you're just joining us once again, you're watching President Biden now meet with a number of first responders that immediately responded upon the collapse of the key bridge. He once again joined by Maryland Governor Wes Moore. A couple of things pointed out prior to this meeting of first responders with the president. Uh, officials stating that $60 million of emergency funds that happened to be released immediately, uh, they calling it they're calling it rather the first wave of many. Um, they're saying that they were able to turn it around in just within a matter of hours. As a result of that, they were able to address a number of traffic issues. Uh, not only that, but really begin to address the issue of removing portions of the bridge. Uh, I found one of the very interesting portions of that conversation that they're also able to extend the amount of cargo that actually makes its way into the port of Baltimore. As I stated earlier, Baltimore receiving some $200 million in cargo on a daily basis. This is a big deal. Earlier today, we know that the White House reached out to Congress to cover 100% of the cleanup. Uh, that remains unknown. Uh, after the president meets with the first responders, as you see he's doing right here, along with Governor Westmore, he will make his way to the press corps where he will address the media. Following that, where it is, is that the president will sit down with a number of the families from those victims that suffered during that tragic day. Uh, let's take a quick peek back in there if we can, see if we can hear what the president is saying. Obviously, meeting with first responders going down the line, and looks like we just lost the feed for that. And so uh, we're going to continue to follow this. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back. And as soon as we know when the president plans to address the nation, you will know right here on the Live Zone. All right, guys, back here on the Fox 5 Live Zone. As stated, we are following uh, coverage of President Biden in minutes expected to address the media, the press corps, just outside of where the collapse of the key bridge occurred. It, it appears as if officials are setting the stage, getting set to have the president address the nation. Just minutes ago, we saw the president meeting with a number of first responders. Uh, he was also given a briefing surrounding all things what has happened since the collapse of the key bridge. We're going to take a listen in now to hear what the executive has to say. For his steady leadership amid this unfathomable disaster. Thanks also to our outstanding federal delegation and to my partners in progress, Mayor Brandon Scott, County Executive Stuart Pittman, as well as all of our local partners for their steadfast support. These are challenging moments that remind us just how interconnected we are. And as we stand here today, for me and countless others who grew up in this very community, we continue to grapple with the loss of a bridge that represented a lifetime of connection. We continue to mourn those we've lost, hardworking members of our community who are simply pursuing a better future, just as we continue to pray for their families and loved ones. And with each passing day, we better understand and are responding to the immense impact that we have seen to the livelihoods of so many of our residents who rely on the Port of Baltimore. Dock workers, truck drivers, small business owners, and more. But even as we stand here today, we recognize that we are literally a community forged by steel, a community that helped build bridges all over this country, a community that helped win world wars. And that same steel resolve remains as resolute as ever in this most recent challenge. This tragedy can do that because we have a president who has our back. Mr. President, thank you again for being here and for all that your team has done and will do. We appreciate you so much. I'd like to welcome next the mayor of Baltimore, Brandon Scott. Good afternoon and thank you, Mr. County Executive. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here to show up for Baltimore in this devastating moment in our history. 
As you can see behind me, the physical impact of this tragedy is massive. But let's be clear, the human impact is immeasurable. And as I've said every day, our focus is and always will be on the human impact. Those who we lost, their families, and those impacted workers and businesses. Baltimore, this region, and this country will be grappling with the ripple effects for many, many, many days to come. But Baltimore is strong. We are built with tough grit, and we will rebuild and come back even stronger. This past week and a half, this incredible team has worked around the clock to ensure that we remain focused on the mission at hand. I'm incredibly proud to see how everyone in our community, every level of government, business, nonprofits, and everyday individuals have come together to wrap their arms around our community, especially those who lost loved ones and the families who continue to bear the brunt of this tragedy. We made a commitment to all of them that we will be here for them every step of the way and forever. And I know we all share a commitment to keeping that promise. As mayor, I'm not naive about the image of our city that has also been fostered by those who don't know it very well. This time feels very different. As we stare down perhaps the biggest complex challenge of our lifetimes, we've shown the world what Baltimore is actually made of. Our love for one another, our commitment to our home, and the grit we have to see it all through. That is embodied by everyone represented here, from the county executives, our wonderful governor who's been leading our unified command, the best congressional delegation a mayor could ask for, the entire Biden-Harris administration, including Secretary Buttigieg, Vice President Harris, and President Biden himself. Every one of those people sees this city the same way I do, through the beauty it holds and the strength that our people exhibit. And we could not ask for better partners, and President Biden is the most important and the biggest partner in that work. He's been that way since day one of his term. Whether it's gun violence, tackling housing insecurity, or infrastructure, President Biden has been here for Baltimore. So I knew that night when I got that call from my fire chief that he would be here now, that he would make sure, as he said, he's moving heaven and earth to make sure that the Port of Baltimore is reopened, that the key bridge is rebuilt, because this is not just about Baltimore. This is about doing as he does each and every day, showing up for American people. I am so deeply grateful uh, for the partnership and strong leadership of President Biden, and I know that we will work together as we have through every single moment of this tragedy, together, uniform and unified, to make sure that we see it through. Thank you, Mr. President, for your leadership, your guidance, and your overwhelming support and love for Baltimore. Uh, but without further ado, I will turn it over to a member of that best uh, congressional delegation in the United States Congress, the man who literally gave me my voice, uh, Congressman Kwasi Mfume. Sir? Thank you very much, Mayor Scott. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Fate and circumstance has called us to this point. How we deal with it and how we get beyond it will depend on our grit, our resolve, and our belief that no mountain is insurmountable. I want to just take a moment to be deliberately redundant and to say to Governor Westmore how much we appreciate your leadership, your stewardship, and your friendship. He will be here in just a second to address all of you, but I can say, as I've said every day that I've been here, this is the best team that I think any t state could put in place to deal with a tragedy like this. I want to certainly thank President Biden, who called many of us just hours after this occurred to pledge in an unwavering way his support, his dedication, his commitment, his resolve to making sure that this bridge is rebuilt again, that these channels are open to commerce again, that the men and women of the unions, particularly the longshoremen and all of the independent businesses and others who have depended on this means of commerce will in fact survive again. I would be remiss if I did not say a word once about the unified command, the Coast Guard and the Army Corps of Engineers who are right now as we speak doing what they must do with 51 divers in place under the bridge and over the bridge, helping to bring about the change that we are all waiting for. 
And I would be equally remiss if did I did not lift for our collective memories those persons that died on that bridge, those families that watch these proceedings and whose hearts break every night, those children who will never know their father as their father knew them, and to all of us who recognize that it could have been any of us, we pray to God Almighty that there is some sense of closure to all of this. So these are difficult, daring times, but we believe that we've got the right grit here in Baltimore and throughout the state of Maryland to deal with that. And may I just say also, lest we ever forget, this port is so significant to the nation that we love. I call on my friends, my colleagues in the Congress to see this as a national tragedy, to recognize that supply lines all over this nation could be disrupted, to understand the severe effect that this would have on our economy, and to recognize as we are just a couple of miles away from where the Star Spangled Banner was written out there, right where that bridge stands, that at the end of the day, we are Americans. Black, white, Jew, Gentile, Asian, Latino, Native American, men and women who have always risen to the challenge. Let me, if I might, bring to this microphone a member of the United States Senate from the state of Maryland, our junior senator, who will soon be our senior senator, and someone like the person that he will introduce is fighting the good fight for all of us in the United States Senate. Please welcome Senator Chris Van Hollen. Well, thank you, Kwaizi, and thank you for being such an incredible, wonderful member of Federal Team Maryland. It's good to be with all of you today. I'm very sorry about the circumstances that bring President Biden to Baltimore, but it's always great to have the President of the United States, Joe Biden, in this great American city. Whether it be moments of triumph, a moment of tragedy, or a moment when we are going to grow from tragedy to triumph. Baltimore is a city that President Biden knows well. He's been here many times. He commuted through here from Delaware. As he will tell you, Biden ancestors came from Baltimore, and he knows that this is a great American city. That's what he told me. That's what he told Senator Cardin, Congressman Fume, the governor, the mayor, and all the others who the president called the day this bridge collapsed. And in those calls, he first of all expressed sympathy and support for the families and loved ones of the six men that we tragically lost that day. He said thank you to all of the first responders, the city level, the state level, and the federal level, recognizing the sacrifices they were making, putting themselves in danger as is being done right now in terms of the, the divers and others. But that day, he thanked those who helped prevent more people from dying in this tragedy. And he pledged to do everything in his power to help every single person impacted by this tragedy, to use the full power of the office of the presidency and the federal government to help the city. And he didn't only pledge his solidarity. By the time he made those phone calls, he had ordered, already ordered the federal government and its agencies to get to work. By that time, the Coast Guard was already on the scene working with other first responders, setting up the unified command. By that time, the president had already ordered the Army Corps of Engineers to begin to figure out how we're going to reopen the port by clearing the channel. By that time, he was also already working to find a way to make sure that the federal government steps in to help cover the costs of building a new bridge. The city of Minneapolis lost a big bridge in 2007. The America came together to help them, and the president has said America will come together to help Baltimore and Maryland at this time. And his team was already on it. You're going to hear from Secretary Buttigieg. I got a call from him at 3 a.m. that morning. 
And it was just one example of how the President's team sprung into action. The funds and setting up the funding for replacing the bridge through the emergency, emergency uh, relief program, you already heard that $60 million has come to the city of Baltimore and Maryland uh, to help deal with the impact of traffic pattern changes. And the President and his team will be working with us, first of all, to make sure that through that emergency relief program, uh, the federal government pays 90 percent of the costs, and they're going to work with us to commit to the President's pledge of 100 percent. Senator Cardin, Congressman Fume, and I will be introducing legislation together with the administration to do that in the coming days. And finally, while the President has been doing all of this, first and foremost was to help with the people who are most impacted by this tragedy, the families of the six, making sure we put our arms around and thank the first responders, and of course, help all those thousands and thousands of people who are impacted by what's happening in the Port of Baltimore as we clear the channel, including the longshoremen that we met with, many of us, just a short time ago. The Small Business Administration is providing emergency loans to every small business impacted by this. The Acting Secretary of Labor has been in Baltimore pledging support for the workers uh, who are not getting paychecks because of what's happening. Tom Perez is out of the White House has been here as well. So the President has committed to three things. Number one, partnership, working with our terrific governor and the governor's team, working with our mayor and the county executives, working with the federal level and all levels of government to get it done. And the message he has said from the beginning, from the beginning, is we have to be there for the people most impacted by what happened. That has been the President's North Star. That's his North Star in Baltimore. That's his North Star in Maryland. That is his North Star for all of the American people. So I'm so proud that we have the President coming back to Baltimore. Sorry about the circumstances, but he will show that America always rises to the occasion, and we will make sure that we come out of this strong. And one of the people who's been leading the way at the federal level has been the head of federal team Maryland. Ben Cardin may not be running for re-election, but I can tell you he is running 24-7 to help the great city of Baltimore and Maryland in this, in this hour of need. He has been a great partner. He's been a great friend. He's a great friend to all of us, a national leader. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senator Ben Cardin. First, let me thank Senator Van Hollen for his extraordinary leadership on this issue and so many issues that affect the people of Maryland. He's a great partner for me to have in the United States Senate. We all have been in various stages of grieving during the last week and a half. This has been a tough time. I want to first thank our first responders. They saved lives. Six of our fellow Marylanders went to work on that day. They went to work to help build our infrastructure, make our roads safer, make America stronger, and to provide resources for their families. They did not return. They lost their lives. Our prayers, our thoughts are with the families, and we will always be there. President Biden made it clear from the beginning that he would be with the people of Maryland every step of the way. Thank you, President Biden. Thank you for giving us what we needed at that moment and every day since and continue to provide the support we need to recover from this catastrophic event. You established the unified command. You've heard my colleagues talk about this unified command. It is something that none of us had ever seen really put up the way it was. We had the experts on every subject, but working together to complete the mission, to open our channel, to rebuild the bridge, 
to take care of the people and businesses impacted. This unified command led by our Coast Guard, our Army Corps of Engineers, Team Maryland, Governor Moore, what an extraordinary leader he's been during this event. We thank him for that. Mayor Scott in Baltimore, the work that he has done. County Exec Doshesky in Baltimore County, the work that he has done. County Exec Pittman in Anne Arundel County. It's been a team effort. As a result, we've made a lot of progress. And you heard the announcements today in regards to opening the channel, and we're already planning for the replacement of the bridge. Thank you, Mr. President, for making that possible by providing the resources and the personnel without delay so we can make this type of progress. I also want to thank my colleagues in Congress on both sides of the aisle who have contacted us and offered their support. When you have a catastrophic event to a critical infrastructure, we come together as a nation. And we will come together as a nation to make sure we do what is right. The key bridge, the Port of Baltimore critical infrastructures. Port of Baltimore, the third largest that we have. All right, Senator Ben Cardin once again addressing all things surrounding the key bridge. We are awaiting the remarks from President Biden. As you can see, he is still meeting with first responders. You can see that on the DMV zone, which is coming up in less than 30 seconds. Hey, want to remind you this upcoming Monday. Yes, we're talking about the total solar eclipse. Our own Mike Thomas live from Buffalo, where they will experience totality darkness. It's something that you're going to get a chance to see right here on the LZ. That's starting at one o'clock on Monday. On behalf of Emmy, I'm Guy Lambert. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back on Monday on the Fox 5 Live Zone at 1. We'll see you then. Happy Friday. We made it. We did it. Joe Claire in the house. The sun is shining. Yes, it is, but it's still cold. Okay, well, the rain has abated, so there's some positive news yes, out there. We're going to talk to Caitlin about that in a second. We're also going to head live to Baltimore, where we are expecting President Biden to speak at any moment now. So let's get you started. You are in the zone. In the zone. Yeah, as usual, these Fridays, they never let us down. We've got a lot of things to get to right now. And again, uh, we are monitoring everything that is happening from Baltimore at this hour. Hello, Joe Claire. Happy Hello, Friday. Hello, Marina Morocco. How are you? Happy Friday. Hey, we're doing good. We're doing good. Doing good. I, was, I just came in from out talking to the people in the streets. Yeah, it's not supposed to be this sunny and cold. It's like when you used you to watch... You want it sunny, but not as cold. Yeah, you used to watch videos of L.A. You'd be like, why do they have on coats? <laughs> no, why does he have on a leather jacket? It's L.A. It doesn't it's... fit. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cold. I know. It's well, cold. we'll get there. Uh, we'll check in with Caitlin, and hopefully we'll get a little bit of warmth coming in yes, for your weekend. We but let's get you started here with your top three at three. Yes, indeed, DMV. We are talking about everything from President Biden in Baltimore today to... Yeah, the weather. We've the got a, a slew of things happening. Again, we're getting uh, some issues as we did yesterday with uh, the prompter here. So exactly. hopefully we can get some uh, clarity here in a second. We have again, a bomb show. That's what's going on. Yeah, That's what's we do. About and we know that there is a lot of issues also as we continue to report on the juvenile crime yes, in D.C. Uh, but of course, that big story of the day right now is the press conference, which is happening as we speak in Baltimore. Let's take you there live where right now uh, we are listening in and looking we're at Senator from Maryland, Ben Cardin there. Uh, he is uh, one of the many people who are there speaking. Uh, the senators, both for Maryland, are there, the junior and the sen senior senator. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, Westmore, who we're waiting to speak. And then the president will be speaking. Now, the president did uh, a little tour of Baltimore today. He did an okay. aerial tour of the bridge site and the collapse. He met with first responders, and he also uh, met with families. So we are expecting yeah. to hear from him at any moment. Again, we'll be monitoring. As you see, uh, people are changing here. And... Uh, Different Thanks very people much, coming Senator up to the podium, as you can see right now, the Secretary for Transportation, P. Buttigieg, is speaking now. He's been at this site uh, since yeah. the collapse of that bridge. But we will continue to monitor this. As soon as we see the president, we will take him live. But right now, let's move on to another story that we have continued to cover here extensively across the region. That's topic number two. 
and that is juvenile crime in D.C. And how do we combat how the crime? Because again, yesterday, we had breaking news here. A 14-year-old shot and killed on the platform of the Brooklyn Catholic University Metro Station. Our Bob Barner live with us now. And at this hour, Bob, they are still looking for that alleged mm. shooter. That's right. Just checked in with D.C. police. No update in the case. The suspect is still out there who pulled a gun here at the Brooklyn Metro Station just a half mile from Catholic University and shot and killed a 14-year-old boy who lives just a mile from here. We can show you a photo of the young victim. His name is Avian Evans. Again, a 14-year-old who was shot and killed, died here at the Metro Station yesterday around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. D.C. police telling us there was some kind of a fight. Uh, there were a number of people involved. A gun was pulled. Shots were fired. The suspect, who appears to be older than, say, 14 years old, 14, 15 year old, uh, apparently had nothing to do with the fight. For whatever reason, allegedly pulled a gun. And that's the suspect there. This is a new photo of him not wearing a mask. The, the uh, surveillance video of him yesterday, the photos, he was wearing a mask. Hopefully someone will be able to identify this guy and get him off the streets. But again, he is still out there. Why he decided to pull a gun, we don't know. Had a chance to uh, catch up with Mayor Bowser today, asked her about this case, and just another young victim to gun violence here in the city. I think what we witnessed was another example of, of the use of guns indiscriminately and how it's impacting young people. Uh, and tragically, we had a juvenile uh, who lost his life. I can't speak to the specifics of that incident today, but whatever they are, I know it wasn't about anything or worth it. Now, this is video from eight years ago at the Deanwood Metro Station, also here in Northeast D.C. And we're showing you this because I had a chance off camera to speak to Avian Evans' parents. They say his older brother, eight years ago, was stabbed and killed at that Metro Station. Johnny Evans was 15 at the time. So the older brother of the 14-year-old killed here at Brook Brookland yesterday was himself murdered at a Metro Station in D.C. Eight years ago, in April of 2016, uh, the killer in that case was captured and prosecuted. The killer in this case is still out there, guys. Unbelievable stuff. Our jaw dropped when you said that, Bob. And again, I yeah. think it, it's just it speaks to the continuation of crime, how it affects our youth, their victims, their suspects. It doesn't matter, but there doesn't seem to be a solution that we can get to. It, just, it speaks to these revolving cycles of violence that we see. Like we said, this is eight years ago, and here we are today. Same metro station same place. We have got to do better as a community in a city. I just have to put that out there. Yeah, yeah guys, so ahead, One Bob. of the things the mayor said today, yeah, I was going to say, one of the things the mayor said today was that earlier this week, and Katie Barlow covered it, uh, she uh, was before the council, uh, you know, reviewing her new next year's uh, fiscal year budget, was talking about new legislation beyond Secure D.C., which was passed by the council just recently, but that would hold young violent offenders uh, more accountable. That's what the community is is calling for. So instead of some people who are caught using a gun in a crime being diverted into some kind of program before ever going before a judge, that would not happen uh, in most cases, according to the mayor today, reiterating that uh, new legislation that she's got out there to try to hold the young people and in some cases their parents accountable for these, these shootings, these murders, all this violence with guns here in the city. I mean, I think that's a fair point. Where are the parents? And I think Where, when you uh, talked yeah. about talk about 14 year olds, 12 year olds, 13 year olds, like we did not that long ago, I, you know, there are bigger questions here. Bob Barnard for us tonight at Brooklyn. But again, uh, the mayor just yesterday talking about truancy, talking about helping fight accountability because right now there situation. is no. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we'll yeah. see. Uh, we'll continue to cover mm. this and hopefully uh, the crime will abate at some point. But we are approaching summer and you know uh, that is it not picks up a in the favorable summer, so I hope situation. the city is listening. We've got to stop this now. Okay, let's go on to topic number three here. A uh, chilly, rainy week to kick off April that we know. Uh, hopefully, it'll make way for some warmer temps. I hope so. We did get past some severe weather earlier this week. Caitlin, uh, you have been uh, the MVP this week has been nonstop. Yeah, I told you guys on Monday, you're really going to dislike me by the end of the week. Yeah. <laughs> we love you. News. Here we are. I know. I heard you, Joe Claire. It is too cold, though. It's April 5th. My gosh. It feels like it should be at least a little bit warmer. We've mostly shaken the rain, although there's a few showers out there. And the weekend, 
I think Sunday is our best bet, and I think Sunday is the day we will finally turn a corner because uh, we've had a lot of gray skies, a lot of let, a lot of wet weather. Look at our cherry blossoms. I mean, they're past peak, yes, but they're still kind of going strong out there at the Tidal Basin. I guess they like the cold weather. It's been nonstop since they hit peak. 55 at Reagan, 54 at Dallas, and 54 at BWI. We once again have seen some clouds and showers pop up, especially to the north and west. So they are swinging through. It doesn't look like they have the strength of yesterday uh, where we had downpours and some really gusty winds, lots of grapple. But today, just a little bit of rain to go along with that increasing cloud cover. The snow showers continue well off to our north as this storm system is stuck sitting over us. But the longer it's stuck, uh, the longer our window, I think, will be during the eclipse for high pressure to be over us. That's just me saying it. I I'm hoping that, really. No guarantees. But uh, low pressure, which will be off to our north and east for Saturday. Saturday. We'll still spin some clouds and chilly breezes, cool temperatures, maybe even a passing shower. So it's not really until Sunday that high pressure builds in. We get full sunshine back. Temperatures are better. I mean, I, we, we should hit 60, but I do think it'll still be uh, a little bit on the chilly side. So for your weekend, you're still needing a jacket, especially tomorrow. Tomorrow will be a lot like today, breezy and cool. And then Sunday uh, into the 60s, and at least psychologically, it will feel better to see a full sunny day. And we want that full sunny day as we head into Monday. So high pressure's overhead. That's good. We don't have a storm system. We don't have a chance of rain. It doesn't look overly overcast. Uh, but it is all about the cloud cover at that moment. So two areas we're watching closely. Us here in D.C., of course, uh, a lot of solar viewing parties, even though we're not in the path of totality. And Mike Thomas will be in Buffalo in the path of totality, which happens uh, right before 3.20 p.m. So cloud cover in this path does look to be the thickest down towards Texas, Oklahoma. They might really battle that. Uh, this is at noon, the European model. The yellow and green is indicating good sky cover, a lot of clearing, and that is what we're going to see it looks like here in D.C. if you go with the European model. And as you get closer to the most significant point in the eclipse uh, towards Buffalo, it looks pretty good, too. This is just one model, but I think, I hope, uh, even if you have partly sunny skies, will be okay. So other cities in the path, you can see Cleveland, Burlington, kind of to the north and west uh, being favored. Partly sunny skies, Buffalo and Washington. Same with Indianapolis, but then, like I mentioned, as you get down towards Dallas and Little Rock, Austin, places like that, people will be lined up ready to see it, but will it be kind of too cloudy to take that in? But uh, we'll be here, and we'll also be enjoying some slightly warmer temperatures, guys, when you look at your seven day on Monday when we're all outside with our glasses on watching. So uh, the big news as we head into next week is not nearly as cold, my gosh. So we are really going to flip the page on these chilly temperatures, which have been with us for several weeks. We're well into the 70s on Tuesday. It does look a little dicey towards the end of the week with more rain and thunderstorms, but we're going to keep those warmer temperatures around as we're in the 70s. Uh, pa uh, so patience will be paying off, I guess, Joe and Marina, as uh, we look a little, little better into next week. All right, I see the 70 on the board. All right. uh, Caitlin, we'll, we'll take what we can get. All right, it's coming up. On Monday, we're gonna, when I'm outside, I, I don't want to be chilled and dark. No, no. You know, it's dark out, it's, it's spooky, it's getting dark, and it's cold. I don't want that. So she said it's going to be 67. Yeah, yeah, it should be good, which I mean, you know, we could have had, if, if the eclipse was this week, no one would have seen anything. So right. it's better than it's Monday. Much better. Perfect. Hey, we'll do that. I'll take it. I will take it. Look, yeah. I'm ready for it. <laughs> the, 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 the squirrels and stuff are ready. I've talked to them. They say, we're ready for it, Joe. Can you talk to Kayla? So we, we're all good. I'm glad I came and did my work today. All right. <laughs> uh, I don't know if we have these pictures up, and maybe we can take them uh, right before we head to break here uh, from Maryland. But we are waiting that press conference from yes. uh, President Joe Biden. You can see everyone who has already spoken there from the Secretary of Transportation all the way to the city of Baltimore mayor there. And unfortunately, that site of the Dali crash into Key Bridge. We will take a quick break. We'll be right back.
All right, we continue to follow that breaking news out of Baltimore as we await now the President of the United States to give his remarks. And again, uh, today he met with first responders there. He did take a tour of that site. It was an aerial tour. Right. Uh, and we, Flew over. Yep, and okay. we uh, saw him also earlier saluting the first responders with the governor there with Westmore. Uh, we have heard from the senators. We've heard from Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg and, of course, from the Baltimore uh, mayor there as yep. well. So we're waiting here. We're watching this for you. And there's some movement, but yet uh, the president to speak. So as soon as we get word, we'll bring that to you. In the meantime, uh, let's move on with other news of the day because the Cherry Blossom festivities, they continue throughout D.C. It's the annual Cherry Blossom races this weekend, which means there will be thousands of runners the and Cherry road Blossom closures races. as well in parts of downtown uh, D.C. Anna Spiegel uh, from Axios joining now with some details. Uh, Anna, we may have to cut out of you uh, quickly here in, this, in, in a little bit because we are waiting uh, for the president. And I think that he is walking up to the podium. So why don't we go back to that press conference before we talk to Anna, just make sure uh, that that is happening as we see Wes Moore there uh, leading the way for President Biden to the podium. Let's listen in. Good afternoon. Mr. President, on behalf of 6.3 million Marylanders, welcome back to Baltimore. I want to thank the mayor, our county leaders, our federal delegation, Marylanders from all walks of life, Team Maryland. We are here together in partnership. And today, and every day, we are thinking of the six victims of the Key Bridge collapse and their families. They are in our hearts, they're in our thoughts, and they're in our prayers. Están es nuestros corazones, nuestros pensamientos, y nuestras oraciones. And 10 days ago, a piece of the Baltimore skyline and a piece of the Baltimore spirit plunged into the river. But the people of Maryland, we rallied. And I tell you, Mr. President, the city of Baltimore is stronger today than ever before. But our strength is not preordained. Marylanders have spent weeks, months, and years focusing on what unites us. Baltimore came together to improve public safety, and last year we brought down homicides to the lowest rates that they have been in almost a decade. Woo. Baltimore came together to drive growth, and this year we have one of the fastest growing economies in the nation. The hardworking people of Baltimore have been training for this moment even if we didn't know it. Our unions, our first responders, our government leaders, our village elders, our business community, all of us have forged uncommon bonds. And partnership is what we do here. And partnership will help us to rebuild the bridge and win this moment. Today, we launch a new partnership with leaders in the public and the private sectors. It is called the Maryland Tough, Baltimore Strong Alliance. The alliance is made up of leaders who are doubling down on their commitment to the city and their commitment to this state. Many have agreed to not lay off employees. Many. Many have agreed to return to Baltimore even if they need to move somewhere else temporarily. And all have agreed to help us build a better future. Foundations, businesses, sports teams, community champions have committed a combined $15 million thus far to support our workers and our neighbors in this moment. The alliance is over 50 members strong, and we are only getting stronger. Maryland 
is building a table that is large enough to include everybody, from our federal partners, to our nonprofit leaders, to our entrepreneurs, to our port workers. And this morning, I signed an executive order to provide $60 million in financial relief for workers and businesses that have been impacted by the key bridge collapse. Now, I know our state's largest city is being tested right now, but Baltimore has been tested before. We get knocked down, we stand back up, and we dust ourselves off, and we move forward. That is what we do. And the people, and the people of Maryland are grateful to have a full partner in this work like President Biden. I received my first call from the White House at around 3 a.m. on the day of the collapse. And every hour since, we've worked hand in hand with this administration. President Biden might not be a Marylander by birth, but I tell you, he's proven what it means to be Maryland tough and Baltimore strong. The president stood with us in the first 100 days of our administration to announce historic funding for the Frederick Douglass Tunnel. And he stands with us today to help the families clear the channel, lift our people, and rebuild this bridge. With the support of President Biden and his team, I know that Marylanders of this generation and the next will look up and once again, they will see the Francis Scott Key Bridge, and they will see it standing tall. The state of Maryland is honored to welcome the President of the United States to one of the most important cities in the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, the 46th President of the United States of America, President Joe Biden. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please, please, thank you. By the way, folks, I say to my dad, Dad, they're mispronouncing Balmer. <laughs> my dad and the Biden, please sit down. The Biden family goes all the way back to being watermen in this bay for a long, long time, back in the mid-1800s. And uh, my father uh, was born and raised here in Baltimore. And uh, there's a strong, strong connection. Still have family in the region as well. Governor Moore, Senator Cardin, Senator Van Hollen, Congressman Fumi, Mayor Scott, County Executive Johnny O. I like that. <laughs> Johnny O, oh, ho, ho. <laughs> to all the military members and first responders, and most importantly, the people of Maryland, I'm here to say your nation has your back, and I mean it. Your nation has your back. <laughs> and you've got, without exaggeration, one of the finest delegations in the Congress of any state in the Union, Amen. and they know how to get things done, and we're going to get this paid for aren't we? Yes, yes, yes. All right. I was just briefed by the United Unified Command about the ongoing impact of this tragic collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge last Tuesday. The damage is devastating, and our hearts are still breaking. Eight, eight construction workers went to the water when the bridge fell. Six lost their lives. Most were immigrants, but all were Marylanders. Hardworking, strong, and selfless. After pulling a night shift fixing potholes, they were on a break when the ship struck. Just seconds before, one of the men named Carlos, who was only 24, left a message for his girlfriend. Here's what it said. We just poured cement. We're waiting for it to dry, he said. Well, to all the families and loved ones who are grieving, I've come here to grieve with you. We all are. It's not the same, but I know a little bit about what it's like to lose piece of your soul to get that phone call in the middle of the night to say, family members of God, I've been there. It's feeling like having a black hole in your chest, 
like you're being sucked in, unable to breathe. The anger, the pain, the depth of the loss is so profound. And we know it's hard to believe, and you're probably not going to believe me, but I can tell you now from personal experience, the day is going to come when the memory of your loved one as you walk by that park or the church or something that you shared together is going to bring a smile to your lips before it brings a tear to your eye. It's going to happen. It's going to take a while, but I promise you it will happen. And that's when you know you're going to be able to make it. I promise you it will come. And our prayers for you is that time comes sooner rather than later, but it will come. We'll also never forget the contributions these men made to this city. We're going to keep working hard to recover each of them. And you know, my vow is that we will not rest, as Carlos said, until the cement has dried and the entirety of a new bridge, a new bridge. <laughs> Earlier this afternoon, we took an aerial tour and survey of the wreckage. You know, from the air, I saw the bridge that's been ripped apart. But here on the ground, I see a community that's been pulled together. I want to thank you all, the first responders, the port workers, state and local officials, who sprang into action before dawn, who've been here ever since. And we did talk, I think it was 2 or 3 in the morning. You were out here. You were here. Within minutes of the collapse, the U.S. Coast Guard arrived on the scene. Within hours, I ordered personnel from the Army Corps of Engineers, the Navy, the Department of Transportation, to insist in every way possible. Within a day, we stood up a unified command. In the weeks to come, I want you to know we're going to continue to have your backs every step of the way. I guarantee you. I guarantee it. First, our first is our priority to reopen the port. This is one of the nation's largest shipping hubs. And it's the top port in America, both in importing and exporting of cars and light trucks, the number one. Simply put, the impact here has a significant impact everywhere up and down the coast and around the country. Thousands of tons of mangled steel remain lodged in the water, blocking ships from moving in and out of the harbor. I've, just, I've directed the Coast Guard, the Navy, and the Army Corps of Engineers, who are, by the way, the finest engineers in the world, and the state officials to work together to help remove this steel as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. So far, our team has been able to clear two small channels for essential ships helping clear the wreckage. And yesterday, the Army Corps announced that by the end of April, they'll be able to open the third channel for some commercial traffic, including car carriers. And by the end of May, we'll open the full channel, the full channel. My task force on supply chain disruption has been able to been engaging with union, rail, trucking, shipping, state and local leaders to minimize the impact on our supply chains. And I'm proud to announce that the federal government will provide over $8 million in grant funds to make the infrastructure improvements at Sparrows Point as the only port unaffected by this collapse, which will allow Sparrows Point to take on more ships. And that's happening now. It will happen shortly. Second, we're focused on protecting the workers and businesses. Folks, 20,000 jobs depend on this port. 20,000 families depend on this port to buy groceries, to make rent, to pay their bills. Today, my administration is announcing the first tranche of dislocated worker grants, fancy phrase, to, which is dimes, all it is there to make sure it helps create jobs for workers involved in the cleanup of this incident, additional jobs. My Small Business Administration has also issued a disaster declaration, which will allow the SBA to offer low-interest loans for small businesses impacted by the collapse in order to keep things moving. The state, the city, the county are also stepping up in impressive ways to help workers and businesses who have been affected by this disaster. But, folks, we all need to step up. Amazon, Home Depot, Domino Sugar, and many other companies all rely on this port. And they have committed to keep workers and payrolls on their and their businesses in Baltimore and move as quickly and clearly as possible to the channel. I'm calling on every company at and around the port to do the same thing, the same exact thing. Commit to stay. 
All right, we've been listening there uh, to Governor Westmore and, of course, President Biden, who, uh, yes, again, uh, this was his first time visiting the site of the Key Bridge collapse. He did uh, make mention of two big notions here mm -hmm. uh, since he spoke that we have just learned that by the end of this month they expect to open a third channel there uh, to the harbor and that will not just be there's two that are open right now that's to aid get the debris this third right. channel will actually be to get commercial traffic in and gotcha. out of the harbor okay. by the end of May he says the full channel will open back up to the port of, Har of uh, Baltimore he says that is paramount at this hour so again about a month and a half left before they believe that they can open that full harbor again we will keep you posted as we get more from that press conference coming in from Baltimore but right now stay with us on the DMV zone right back We've been talking about it all week long on Monday come 3.20 p.m. The solar eclipse <laughs> will hit 87% totality right here in the region. So not a total eclipse, but no. pretty darn close. Close enough. We'll take it. But will it be a sight to see? And there are a few things you need to know, especially about safety. So let's check in with our Jennifer Dugato live with those details tonight. Hey, Jen. Hey, Jen. Hi there, Marina. Hi there, Joe. Yeah, I know the clock is ticking. Everybody's super excited about the total solar eclipse. As you mentioned, we'll get about 87%, but still, you need to wear these protective glasses. Well, we are live right now in Tenley Town, right outside the Tenley Friendship Library. Well, if you were hoping to get some glasses, Look at the sign right there. Josh Harrington, the photographer, zooming in. It shows you, sorry, we are all out of solar eclipse glasses. That's pretty much the same thing you're seeing all across town. Well, hopefully you were able to get some of the glasses because, you know, if you look at the sun without any protection, it could lead to some problems. Well, we checked in with a local doctor, and he had this to say if you dare to look at the sun. Let's listen in. A lot of times, just like um, when you go out and get a sunburn, you're not going to get the um, damage immediately. So if you think that you did stare at the sun, you should really consult your eye doctor um, and let them know that you looked up, and that way they can give you a further retina eval to make sure that you haven't damaged your macula. So you may not notice it right away. But Correct. 
correct. But I mean, if you think you looked at it, even for a couple of seconds, um, you didn't have the bright protection, you didn't have the IS glasses on, you should consult um, your retina specialist. Okay. All right, well, you heard from Dr. Uh, Chris there. Well, he said that, of course, you don't want to look at the sun. You also don't want to point your camera to the sun because that will damage your camera as well and, of course, your eyes. Now, many people have been walking around looking for the glasses. Joining me right now is Jessica. And, Jessica, you got lucky today. Maybe you need to buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> yes. We called around to um, a couple of library locations. Where man we managed to get a pair at uh, the Chevy Chase you library scored. location. We did. We scored. You yeah. did. Score. You know, I called there yesterday, I called all around, and a lot of these libraries are left out, but, you know, are running out, but, you know, it, 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 it's something you want to experience, right? Oh, definitely. Um, it was really cool in 2017. Uh -huh. uh, that time I wasn't so lucky, I ended up having to get a pair of the glasses uh, from someone on either Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist. But <laughs> something a little year, sketchy. Oh, it, yeah, I, fortunately, they, they <laughs> were legit. My eyes are You're okay. You're still alive. <laughs> you can see. You can but, see. yeah, you definitely need to get the right glasses. Right. Okay. And, you know, the thing, too, is... <laughs> Thank you so much, Jessica, yeah, for sure. joining us. Uh, you want to make sure your glasses have this code on there. They have to say ISO. Now, I was able to pick up some glasses today, um, actually, at the Warby Parker. You can try some of the chain optical places. Some of them still have some of the protective glasses. And the other thing, if you're planning on putting these on, and maybe you're working, maybe you're delivery or driving, don't put these on while you're driving because you can't see anything. And of course, you're going to potentially crash into some. I think that seems obvious, but apparently there is that warning out there telling people, do not wear these while you're driving. And of course, you can't just wear the old fashioned sunglasses, um, the regular sunglasses. It's not gonna block out enough light. So we wanna prep our peepers. And of course, uh, hopefully everybody at the station has theirs. I am going to be going to St. Louis. Well, I will experience complete totality. So I'm like, uh, Mike, we're geeks. We're gonna go out there and chase this down. Well, lucky you, lucky you. But are, you have, I'm glad that you gave I'm that. I'm going to see my uh, mom too. I'm glad you <laughs> gave that disclaimer to tell people not to wear these while they drive because you know people in the DMV I mean, hello, will try right? to wear those while they drive. <laughs> Yeah. Somebody will. It should be I can already see people behind the wheel. You know, with the somebody glasses. will with one of those shiesty masks on and the glasses. <laughs> these young people. Y'all know I'm telling. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. They might Don't. even put like a face mask on their eyes. Exactly. Or you never know. <laughs> you see, you know, Jim knows exactly what I'm All talking right, Jen, about. All right, Jen. Thank you. Uh, good luck seeing totality out there in St. Louis. Okay, let's. Uh, yes. Speaking of the partial eclipse, which is really what we're going to see here, let's bring in a very special guest right now because yes. in honor of the eclipse, the Animal Welfare League of Arlington is hosting the partial eclipse of the Heart Adoption event, and live with us here in the DMV zone is Chelsea no. Jones no. and the star of the show, this little guy with us. His name is Yam. Yam. Hi, Yam. Yam. So good to Can see I you. Can I get to the Yam? <laughs> Chelsea, uh, this is, uh, you know, I think any opportunity that we can get to help adopt these beautiful yeah. puppies and dogs, uh, we will share that. And I know you guys have this special event. So yeah. what do people need to know if they are so inclined uh, to come by? and see these guys and maybe adopt. Yeah, we would love a lot of adopters this weekend. We have so many wonderful dogs, cats, rabbits, guinea pigs ready for adoption, and everyone over six months is 80% off in honor of the partial eclipse. 80% off. about that? 80% off. Yep. off. Okay. Saturday through Monday. I know that's Saturday right. You out here spit. You out here chasing <laughs> coupons for other stuff. Here's eighty percent off a yes. yam. That is okay. So when Beautiful people come dog. in to adopt, do they need to do any prior paperwork? You know what? Because I think for people, it's this is a big deal. Yeah. You know, you're bringing home a family member. Mm -hmm. You're meeting them for the first time. What can they expect when they walk through the doors? Yeah, so at, at the Animal Welfare League of Arlington, we make it really easy to adopt. We know our community wants to do a good thing. So you come in, you find a pet that you're interested in. All we really need is uh, your ID and you fill out an application and take it home and that's it yep I it's that it. easy are yep. they vaccinated do they have everything yep. up to speed so do you need to do any other work just spoil them okay yam now you also mentioned not just dogs you have mm -hmm. snakes guinea pigs rabbits <laughs> what do I have right now I have mice chinchillas mice. rabbits guinea pigs uh, gerbils cats kittens all the things. You have a chinchilla? <laughs> I have four chinchillas there. Four chinchillas? <laughs> oh, I, I'm about to go get some chinchillas. They are nice chinchillas, now, too. Now, they're going to be, I'm not going to do anything but have them at my house, but okay. who do you know who has a chinchilla? And well, I'm, one of them, Chubby, is a, you can hold him. He's a really see? nice chinchilla. Me and Chubby chinchilla. <laughs>
walking around the DMV. <laughs> Can you walk out with maybe yam and then also a chinchilla and chubby? Hey, if you got the space and the you're ready for it, absolutely. <laughs> Come on through. So Eighty percent so off. If people are watching us right now and they're like, "We love yam," tell me more about this guy. Hey, so yam is about three years old. We have had him for several months hey. um, at the oh. shelter, and he's good with kids, good with dogs. He's so easygoing, and yet no one has asked to adopt him yet. It's, it's Come really on, sad. Let's get I know. Yam some parents. So we're hoping this is the nice weekend. Y'all see how nice a dog is. Look how nice this dog is. He's it's been nice charming dog. everyone. Oh, oh yeah, he's been a total yeah. star here at Fox 5. He just wants a forever home. Yes. You are the cutest thing ever. And he's such a All right, so dog. there you go. Give us the last details about times again and when people can come in for that 80% discount. What are the dates? So, come visit us Saturday through Monday, the 6th through the 8th. You get 80% off adoption fees for all adult animals. There you go. One more. There come on, Yam. Let's go. get you a nice Can home and somebody to go to. He's so cute. All right. Stay with us here on the DMV Zone. We're taking a quick break. We'll be right back. Show say bye, Yam. <laughs>
people thinking about their good couch plans yes. or their movie theater plans? What you got, Kevin? I don't think a lot of people realize this, by the way. So in between the shows that we do here on Fox 5, so I'm on the air usually till noon when we do Lion Lunch Hour, and then there's a break of three hours before DMV Zone. Obviously, you can check out Live Zone, our online show as well. With Guy Lambert. With Guy Lambert. But I do a lot of interviews that you end up seeing on this show in that block of time. So I just got off of a Zoom with Chris Pratt uh, for his new movie, Garfield, and uh, we got into a, some really, really interesting discussions. So we'll have that interview coming up, hopefully in a couple weeks. I also chatted the other day in between our shows with Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt uh, for the new movie, The Fall Guy. So if you uh, if are just tuning in or you just watch our 3 o'clock show and you haven't seen our morning show, all those interviews you can watch on Good Day DC and Lion, obviously here on DMV Zone. But check out all of our shows, of Very, course. very yeah, yeah. cool. talking to Ryan no, Gosling while you guys were at like night. I'm just, so, so it's I my left, job. As soon as I got finished, I talked yeah, yeah. to Ryan Gosling, and then after that, God called me. I, I and then after that, I'm going to talk to mm. Jesus. You know I interviewed Jesus this morning. Man, you doing it. You know, I'm killing it. Right. Right. I'll tell you this. Like, I've been doing this for almost over 15 years now, and people always think I'm, like, dropping names. I'm not. It's just my job. I'm just messing with no, you. No, I know, no, I know. Just it's just my with job, you. though, yeah. All right, so anyway, let's, let's watch this weekend. Let's start off ta talking about a couple of things you can watch in theaters. The first okay. one uh, is The First Omen. This is a brand new... Uh, well, this is Monkey Man. We'll do Monkey Man first. So Monkey Man is a new action thriller uh, directed by the incredible Dev Patel. You know him from Slumdog Millionaire. This right. is a film that's produced by Jordan Peele. The movie is in theaters this weekend. It's a revenge film. The character's following the revenge uh, after his mother is killed as a young boy. Uh, and all these years later, trying to track down the people responsible for it. But Dev Patel really is one of my favorite actors working today. Uh, as I mentioned, Slumdog Millionaire and Lion. Uh, but this movie is a film that's a labor of love for him. He directed this film. It took him many years to make it. He broke a lot of bones making the film. I saw a story the other day that he had to re-choreograph a fight scene because he broke his arm or hand during the fight, so they had to make the fight a one-arm fight. Oh my it's kind of crazy how they did I saw it on Twitter. I think it was on Discussing Film. Um, but it was a really, really cool uh, uh, film, and the action is incredible. But one thing I do love about this movie is outside of the John Wick-style revenge movie that, you're, that you think it might be, it's heavily thematic about societal aspects, commentary, the way we treat people in this world. It's a really fascinating look at that idea of the world as well, while also being a great action movie. So that's definitely an option this weekend. Jordan Peele produced it, and he was very passionate about helping this movie get into theaters. Originally, it was a Netflix movie, and now it's being released in theaters this weekend. Oh. Um, the next up is Monkey The First Man. Omen. Yes, The First okay. Omen. I uh, Remember the 1976 uh, Omen film? Yes. With, uh, with Damien, the Oh, I'll never film. forget that as long as I live. Did you, did you see it in theaters? Man, no. I was, I was no. What do you hey, mean? I was too scared, man. You too scared? He was, he had everybody shook when yeah. we were kids. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. Nobody, we ain't mess with Damon. Have you seen Damon. the, uh, have you seen the Omen, Maria? No, I've not. Okay, well, the 76 Omen is considered one of the greatest horror movies of okay. all time. Yeah, man, he so, had us shook. So if you're not familiar, <laughs> the, this new first Omen is actually a prequel or an origin story of Damien. So we're actually leading up to the events of the first Omen film in 1976. Uh, they did a really good job. This is a very R-rated, heavily brutal horror film. I will tell you, there's a lot of body horror in this movie. This is not a movie that is a, is a pleasant experience unless you're a big horror fan. It definitely does rattle those cages in terms of being a horror movie uh, fan. So that's available in theaters. Just a warning to parents. This is definitely not for young kids. Uh, it is a very, very violent and brutal horror film. Uh, that is available now. It's I will... not even suitable for many of yeah, kids. Yeah, it's pretty wild. All right, next... Damien? Hey, listen. <laughs> next up is a little uh, show called Ripley. So this is... Uh, so actually, this is what's really interesting about the next two things I'm about to talk about is they're both film noir series. So this okay. is actually a new series on Netflix called Ripley based on the very popular book The Talented Mr. Ripley from 1955. There was a movie in 99 with uh -huh. Matt Damon and uh, Jude Law and Gwyneth Paltrow called The Talented Mr. Ripley as well. This is directed by Steve Zalian who wrote uh, Schindler's List. He also wrote Irishman and gotcha. tons of other things. He directed Searching for Bobby Fischer as well. This stars Andrew Scott as a grifter who's hired by somebody to go to Italy to track down and it's a really just, you know, it's a detective style you know, it's very like private like I, I don't know. To me, it's a film noir. It's very classic in that nature. But also, the character of Ripley is a very fascinating character to follow and watch. And Andrew Scott does a great job. You might know him from Fleabag. Also, All of Us Strangers. That's streaming now on Netflix. All episodes. And then I know Marina's excited about this one, Sugar. Uh, this is a brand new film uh, series as well on Apple TV Plus, starring Colin Farrell. We had Colin Farrell on the show earlier this week talking about some of his favorite movies. In this particular story, his character is hired by a legendary film producer played by James Cromwell, uh, and his character, Colin Farrell's character, is supposed to track down the producer's granddaughter. Um, again, very much like a film noir, private detective.
detective, private eye type of story, but Colin Farrell does a great job. I watched the first episode, it's fantastic. Uh, really well shot and designed, but also just that classic film noir that I love. Uh, this is available on Apple TV Plus. As you do know, Apple TV Plus is one of the few streaming services that releases their shows week to week. Mm. So Netflix drops them all at once. Apple TV uh, does them week to week, maybe two at a time or so. And I think that actually helps with keeping a show alive. You talk about it more, you wait for the show to come yep. out. It's appointment viewing of television. So those are your options this weekend. Uh, make sure you stay tuned next week. I'm gonna have interviews with Kirsten Dunst, as well as Kaylee Spaney, as more, as well as Jesse Eisenberg and Riley Keough. So stay tuned all next week for some more interviews right here on Fox 5. Very there cool. You Thank you, Kevin. You got a lot to choose was from that this on the weekend. Air? That, did, I, did everything get on the air? We're still on the we air. Are, this was a practice, practice run. This was a practice run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, cool, cool. <laughs> Let's take we a quick break. We'll be right we'll back. We'll now. We'll do it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Last week, we got a little preview. The D.C. Defenders, they will kick off their home opener. It's on, baby! With the district's UFL team. And this weekend is their second game of the season. It's happening right here on Fox 5 on Sunday. Our Chad Ricardo live with us now, down from the Navy Yard, with more on what we can expect. Hey, Chad. 
That's right, Joe and Marina. Spring football is back. As you alluded to, this is week two of the UFL, and our D.C. defenders are going to be taking on the Houston Roughnecks right here at Audi Field. Now, as we take a look here at this field out here, you can come down to watch this game here. This is a team that was outstanding last year. They went a, a total of 9-1, and one, made it to the then XFL championship game, and they bring a ton back. They've got head coach Reggie Barlow coming back. They've got their quarterback, Jordan Tayamo as well. And if you didn't get a chance to see the week one action of the UFL, the in-game experience is phenomenal as well. If you're watching on TV, as you can hear with us at Fox 5, Sunday at 4 o'clock, we've got coaches that are going to be mic'd up. They're going to tell you all of the plays that they're calling on both sides of the ball. They've got the officials that are going to be mic'd up. So when there is a play that's in review, they're going to show you what it is that they're going to look at, and they're going to tell you why it is that they made the calls that they made. And the best thing about, of course, the D.C. defenders is this team's in-game experience is phenomenal. Now, if you've seen games from other teams around the country, some fans show up to those games. Some fans are excited about it. The DMV brings all of the energy. Audi Field is going to be packed on Sunday. The fans are going to be cheering. The excitement is going to be pumped up. And yes, Joe Claire, the beer snake will be in the building as well. So whether you come down here to Audi Field or whether you watch with us on Fox 5 Sunday at 4, the D.C. Defenders are back and they are ready to attempt to win this UFL championship. Woo. Joe yes. Marina, I'm pumped up. Yes, Woo. indeed. I'm pumped up with you. Beer Snake, let's go. I want to go, but I want to wear <laughs> that suit that you have on because you are killing us. Here today, we go, sir. Joe. Come on, Joe. Come Show on, Joe. What's up, you Chad? see the dunks, Joe? Take a I look see at you. take a look at them them Ben and Jerry dunks, Joe. <laughs> Joe Claire, how about that? How about that, Joe? I love it. I love it. <laughs> wow. From top to bottom. Incredible stuff. Yes, indeed. Give it to him, Chad. <laughs> the Ben and Jerry's dunk. D right. DC Defenders, come down here to Audi Field or, again, watch it on Fox. It's a great lead, great opportunity. Definitely. Again, uh, Fox 5, watch it here. Let's stay with Fox 5. DMV Zone back after this. Be right back. Break. I'm getting that suit. <laughs>
Barrow, you can get... Okay, we were having a very big discussion yes, about we all the irrelevant things in life, like Cracker Barrel... Versus Ooh, Waffle House. Or Waffle House. Ooh, cracker, ooh. I'll take the Cracker Barrel pancakes oh, any no. day. Well, I, I love the pecan roll that you can get in that little general store. And I yeah. like the fact you can rock in the chairs at the Cracker Barrel. Yeah. I also love, though, uh, some smothered hash <laughs> browns at Waffle House. Okay. How can you You choose? like it all. I see. I I'm telling you, Waffle House all day, every day. <laughs> it's a great discussion. Uh, too bad it's not like it or not. But y'all have a yeah. great show. I know. Yeah. Sorry hey, I couldn't help you much, guys. But happy Friday to you. The happy news at four starts now. And right now at 4, the search continues for the gunman accused of killing a teenager at a metro station. What we're learning about that young victim and his family. Plus, President Biden in Baltimore. The president addressing the bridge collapse and delivering a promise for when the entire channel will be reopened. And East Coast earthquake reaction to that rare event that rattled the Northeast. D.C. police still looking for the young man seen in this surveillance video, suspected of shooting and killing a 14-year-old boy at the Brooklyn Catholic University Metro Station Thursday. And we're learning more about the young victim today. Fox 5's Bob Barnard is live at the Brooklyn Metro Station with the very latest. Hi, Bob. Hey there, Shamari. The killer is still out there. The young person shot to death here at the Brookland Metro Station yesterday was a 14-year-old boy. And we've learned that the victim from yesterday's case had an older brother murdered at a D.C. Metro Station eight years ago. This was the 14-year-old boy shot and killed Thursday, Avian Evans of Northeast D.C., his home just a mile from the metro station where he was murdered around 4 in the afternoon. Police telling us young people on the station platform were fighting. Somebody pulled a gun and started shooting. It was terrible, so terrible. I feel, I feel, I feel so sorry for the family. Avian Evans was pronounced dead here at the metro station. Police releasing new photos of the suspect, who was apparently not involved in the fight. His face clearly shown in the photos. Metro riders here once again shaking their heads. It's real sad, very sad. And I'm, I'm hurting, you know, as we speak. You know, because, you know, I have a son, you know, and I look at all kids as my sons, you know, and I, and I hope we stop. It need to stop. At the ribbon cutting for the new D.C. Health Department headquarters building in Anacostia today, we asked Mayor Muriel Bowser about the murder of Avian Evans. I can't speak to the specifics of that incident today, but whatever they are, I know it wasn't about anything or worth it. Witnesses to this shooting caught on camera Wednesday night on Capitol Hill say the young people running from that lone gunman also fired shots during the confrontation, two of those bullets striking a parked car with a woman inside. Mayor Bowser telling us new legislation she's proposed this week would prevent the placement of some young violent offenders into diversion programs before their cases ever go to court. We don't think it's appropriate, and more than... We, being me and our team, we don't think the public thinks it's appropriate. Um, they want to know that if there's a crime using a gun committed, that there is going to be accountability. So that's what the bill would do. And we've learned from the Evans family, who lost 14-year-old Avian to gun violence here at the Brooklyn Metro Thursday afternoon, that they buried his older brother, John, after the 15-year-old was stabbed to death at the Deanwood Metro Station, also in Northeast D.C., eight years ago this month. Now, the killer in that case was ultimately caught. Uh, I spoke to both parents off camera. They also tell me that uh, they had a middle son who died in a violent death here in the city about a year ago. That's three sons from one family. It's so tragic. It's so tragic. Yeah. All right, Bob, thank you. Let's shift gears now, take a live look outside. We bring you a the view, a beautiful city of view. Frederick. I know, welcome. Uh, this is a place I hear they have great, great little town there with yeah. a cupcakeery. They got some nice go coffee to. shops. I like yeah. the restaurants. It's a good little, good yeah. little area. Regardless, a great day to get outside. Caitlin's yeah. here yeah. to verify. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, guys. Happy Friday to we you. Made it. Oh, yeah. oh, give me high fives all around. Yeah. I know, all please. Right. Thank you. Okay. I mean, we yes. took a long we one, so it. whatever you, whatever you make it. it, it's all good. <laughs> yes. uh, look, it was a long <laughs> week of weather, too. Yes. I mean, cold, wet, windy, storms, tornado warning.
<laughs> we did it all. Let's just put a wrap on this one because it is still very chilly out there. And guess what? Uh, another day with a few showers out there. Not a lot, but still five days in a row where we've at least had some green on the map. And some of those days, it was hefty rainfall. So nothing too gusty at the moment. You know, yesterday we had those passing downpours that were so strong. There was a lot of grapple reported. But this time, it's just very light stuff, mostly to the north and west of the city. Over 81 in the mountains, you see a little bit of green. So these are just some light showers. They could swing through. Otherwise, we're seeing those nice peaks of sunshine through the clouds, which is helpful. I think by the second half of the weekend, we'll get back to real pure sunshine. 53 in D.C. It's chilly out there. 48 in Gaithersburg and Frederick. Just 44 in Martinsburg and 43 in Winchester. The gusts are pretty high, so it is blustery with occasional winds peaking at 28 miles an hour in D.C., 29 in Baltimore, 33 in Manassas. Through tonight, if you are heading out and about, not much of a shower chance by sunset. However, it's cold. We fall into the 40s. You still need a decent jacket when you step outside tomorrow morning. We are only in the 30s outside of the Beltway. Better by Sunday, we turn a corner into next week, and I'll have a look at that very important eclipse forecast for Monday. That's all coming up. Angie? Thank you, Caitlin. And that earthquake this morning had people buzzing up and down the East Coast. We want to get right over to Marina Morocco joining us in studio right now with more. I mean, that's not the camera messing up. That's the earth shaking. Oh, yeah. There was a lot of shaking today. Angie, the earth cam capturing that moment. 4.8 magnitude earthquake shook the New York City metro area. It was reported about 1020 this morning with the epicenter in Lebanon, New Jersey. It's about 45 minutes away from New York City. Now, we do have some video from a home in New Jersey where you can see here at a playpen, the dog's crate there shaking, and you can definitely hear it. No major damage there or anywhere so far. But according to the United States Geological Survey, they got reports of people feeling the shaking as far north as Maine, as far south as Norfolk, Virginia. We've not seen many reports of people feeling it around this region, but it definitely startled some near that epicenter. I was in my son's bedroom making his bed and all of a sudden the whole like room started shaking. The walls started shaking and it was like so weird. My husband was downstairs and he was in the basement and he felt that my other son was in his room. It was scary. I'm still like shaking. My head's like shaking. My legs are shaking. <laughs> she really was shook up. But uh, the good news here is that nothing as far as damage has been reported so far. Major airports along the East Coast issued a ground stop afterwards, including BWI. At about 1 o'clock, BWI said it had completed a check of its airfield surfaces, has since resumed flights there. However, they are recommending that anyone that's flying northeast should check their flight status first. But certainly, mm. Angie, a lot of text messages today to my phone from Florida asking if everything was okay. I was like, what happened? I don't even I know. Because it's a rarity, right? I mean, it's just, we don't see that really around here. And, uh, but I'm with that woman. I mean, if I had experienced it, oh, yeah, I would have been just as riled up and worked up as she was, too. Just glad everybody's okay. Totally. All right. Thanks, Marina. President Biden has toured the Key Bridge wreckage. This comes a little more than a week after the collapse, killing six construction workers. Fox 5's Lili Zhang joins us live with more. Hi, Lili. More. Hey, Shamari, the president's remarks lasted just over 10 minutes this afternoon. During it, he doubled down on the federal government's commitment to assisting Maryland in this recovery process. Now, today, the president did take an aerial tour of the wreckage site and the work that's being done. Now, we also learned today of a tentative timeline of opening a 280 feet wide, 35 feet deep channel by the end of this month. We're told that the plan is to reopen the permanent channel by the end of May. Last week, the administration did approve a $60 million grant for the state of Maryland in terms of relief. We're told that this is not going to be used for construction, reconstruction rather, of the bridge, that this is for things like debris removal. The president said today that the federal government will help the state with what it needs in terms of funding. To all the military members and first responders, and most importantly, the people of Maryland, I'm here to say your nation has your back, and I mean it. Your nation has your back. Now, this afternoon, the president did not take questions. We could hear some reporters were trying to get a question or two to the president before he left the stage. We are also told that, uh, again, he still has a schedule after this speech that he just gave. Uh, the president also, his remarks did come after a few elected officials from the state of Maryland, as well as federal leaders. Shamari. Lee, has the president met with the victims' families? 
So according to his schedule for today, he was scheduled to meet with these victims' families. He did also address the, the families during his remarks this afternoon. Keep in mind that from this collapse, six construction workers were killed. Two of their bodies were found last week. As of this, as of this point, Shamari, four of those still remain missing during this salvage operation. All right, thank you, Lily. Well, the new harm reduction vending machine project officially launched in D.C. today with opioid overdoses at an all-time high. The Health Intervention Initiative is now hoping to help save lives by putting free overdose prevention supplies in areas with the high rates of overdose and death. Now, the machines are launching officially at three sites in the city this month. We also have a, um, an industrial size safer sharps disposal container right next to the machine um, that folks can access 24-7, um, which has just been incredible. Like, you know, Hibs tries to do as much as we can in terms of supporting the community as many hours of the day as we can, but we can't be 24-7, but these machines can. So once folks are enrolled in the program, they can access these services 24-7, 365. The machines include self-care products from hygiene and wellness to Narcan and also fentanyl strips. And it leads to our Fox 5 Live Instable question. It is posted, do you think that Narcan vending machines are an effective way to fight the fentanyl crisis? You can scan your vote right now. Just scan that QR code right there. 95% uh, of you say no. You don't think it's going to make a difference, but you can still cast your vote on the Fox 5 DC website. Look for the Instapol. Now we want to bring you some top caught on camera moments. Mm. A potential porch pirate. Oh. Another one? Yes, another one. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh my hey, goodness. apparently he picked the wrong house, right? Yes, he did. Walked up to the porch. Homeowner comes out with a bat. Apparently the homeowner was fed up with people stealing his packages, so he set up a decoy. He kept the man there until the police came. Police arrested the suspected porch pirate. This is how you do it, folks. Yes, and yesterday Watch we had learn. a potential, I uh, guess, suspected porch pirate who was under a trash bag yeah. in our marina. You and I were talking about it. And can you imagine if this guy came up with the baseball bat on the trash bag guy? Listen, Yikes. I feel like this could be the making of a reality show. You think so? Right? Like, we just set him up to catch a, to catch a porch pirate. To catch a porch pirate. <laughs> there Girl, we go. I like that. That's a good one. All right. All right, moving along. Dash cam video showing just how narrowly a police officer avoided being hit by a falling tree. I'm so glad this officer is okay check this out you guys this is in maine and as heavy snow swept through the state the tree came crashing down just as the officer was approaching the bend and oh, luckily wow. nobody was hurt this is really scary i mean we, yes. we complain about the cold and gloomy weather mm -hmm. we had this week but in other parts of the country they're really seeing some severe stuff and obviously some close calls yes. uh, a dog's dream comes true but an Whoa. easter bunny's nightmare <laughs> at a mall in oh florida uh, that's that? a big chew toy uh, the goal was to have a portrait drawn with the Easter Bunny. Oh Instead, this dog seemed to think that the Easter Bunny looked like a stuffed animal or a meal. Mm. He sh the, the owner actually showed the video with a disclaimer. No Easter Bunnies <laughs> were actually harmed in the making of this video, but... Um, yeah, I wonder if he did the sniff test, yeah, too, Yeah, let's right? keep this dog away from Halloween. Imagine somebody coming to the house, they have on a costume, the dog oh, just goes yeah. nuts, right? I know, good do guard dog. Good yeah, he's, he's doing his thing, but, you know. Especially if you have a porch pirate. Yeah. He won that button oh, nose, right? He saw the pink ball, and he's like, let's I play know. fetch. Yes. Yeah, the Easter Bunny was not they having it. They baited him. It wasn't the dog's <laughs> fault. Yeah. All right, guys, still to come here at 5 and 4, Madonna firing back at the fans mm. who sued her for starting her concert late. Oh. Should the lawsuit be tossed out? We're talking about that next in Trending. Plus, a red flag raised over the mayor's budget and how it could make child care more expensive in the district. We'll explain. And later, all your questions answered about the solar eclipse and how to safely view it. Five at four on this Friday's Just Getting Started. We'll be right back. Can't Stay wait with us. for Monday. It's going to be great.
Okay, we made it. Oh, yay, I'm glad you could slide right in. That was my bad. Hey. I'm here. Thank you, Angela. Hey, Marina. <laughs> All right, guys, let's talk about what's trending tonight. First up, Madonna's legal team asking a judge to toss out a lawsuit over her late concert start time. The material girl was sued after she started a concert two hours late in New York City last December. The suit claims Madonna, along with the venue in England, Willful false advertisement and misrepresentation. Well, Madonna's lawyers argue the two plaintiffs in the suit didn't show any clear injuries from the late start. They add that she rarely starts concerts on time, and her fans know that. And fans got what they paid for, a quality mm. performance. You know what I would argue? Bad what? sleep. Yeah. Anxiety and bad sleep. That's, I, that's terrible injury. But why not be on yeah. time for your concert? I mean, right. you'd be nothing without your fans. Because and a lot it's of these people, mad. Okay. Get over yourself. Now, you newer fans, I, I bet you it's probably these youngins that are like suing no, her and stuff. No, because All us olds were like, it's Madonna. You don't show up till late. Angie, you know, she doesn't. What? The youngins don't listen to Madonna. I have been to different concerts <laughs> or you don't and go people show. have been on time. You don't, she's got this reputation. Oh, you just don't go. Okay. I'll give right? you that one. Listen okay. to that's it. That's the thing. a start time on the ticket. You know, we start at 4 o'clock here. We don't start at 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. I start at 5 p.m. Anyway. Madonna's on a different level. She's is she? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Angie. That's because people <laughs> catapult her up there. I don't know why. Yeah, but anyways. she's a queen. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll go to Wu-Tang concerts back in the day. They were always on time. Conway the Machine, <laughs> 21 Savage, all of them. That's great. Gunna. Hey, all Celine on Dion, the real queen, she was on time, too. Well, so, for all you on timers, Madonna, learn a thing or two. All you on timers, mm -hmm. then enjoy those concerts. But for those of us who prefer <laughs> to be late, I hope the judge takes this time. up and gives them something. <laughs> right, let's move on. Uh, things didn't go exactly as planned at the inauguration of a brand new Olympic pool in. Ooh, oh no! Oh oh oh! Oh, no. oh, oh, oh gosh! Oh, that okay. was in France. Yes. Some of the world's top divers, they were there ready to show off their skills, and then that happened. One of the divers falling off the board, but to make matters worse, the event attended by thousands of people, including the French president. The oh, diver posting goodness. on social media, his back is fine, his ego is not. What happened? I don't know. He it looked slipped. like his ankle is, like, watch. His ankle buckled. Right there. Oh, he just right landed there. on one foot. All he had yeah. to do, all he has to do is tell people, look, I was imitating Raji, or Rob, Rodney Dangerfield in Back to, <laughs> Back School, to School, right? <laughs> Where he's, like, bouncing from, you know, <laughs> dive board to dive board. I was just doing that. Listen, Olympians, they're just like us. I feel like this makes them relatable, okay? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> okay. no shame. Get back on the board. Attorney today? My uh, goodness. Uh, just pick yourself up and get back on the board. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Okay. I bet you it's going to make him better. There you go. Yeah, he's, that's but, what my quote wall says. He's still going to be embarrassed, <laughs> but that's okay. Move on. Strive for know. bronze, everybody. All right. Thank you, Marina. Hopefully he's not diving into Potomac off the Capitol Wheel because right now you're looking at a live look outside at National Harbor at mm -hmm. the Capitol Wheel and yeah. it's a little uh, you know a little dark out there on a well, Friday but it's Friday and that's all that matters you right. See some clouds but hey I mean look at the uh, the water moving kind of fast it tells me yeah. we got a breeze out there right. Yeah that's some cold water I would not want to be <laughs> in at this point yeah. I know with no. the wind too mm -hmm. so uh, seeing a few peaks of sun there which is nice but still probably colder than anyone prefers it to it be for the 5th of April. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, I woke up, woke up. I look out the window. Oh, it's sunny. Oh, it's going to yeah. be a great day. And then literally like 30 minutes later, mm -hmm. it was dark outside. It was just cloudy. I know. It's deceiving. And I'm like, just stop. Out Mother Nature needs to stop playing with my emotions. I know. Well, hey, <laughs> this is April, right? Yeah. And at one point, I thought it was in reverse because we saw such like warm temperatures I back know. in March. Mm -hmm. And now it's like April was coming in like a lion. Well, how about some continuity, so. right? Yeah. March you know? ended up being like such a warmer first half of the month in mm -hmm. April. So. I mean, it all has to balance out, I suppose. But uh, we should turn the corner here soon. More sun by Sunday. And along with that, temperatures will really warm up into next week. So I'm not saying we're done with the chilly conditions completely, but we are going to take a nice break from it. And then our window for cold obviously starts to shorten as we get deeper into spring. But yeah, a little dark uh, as we take a live look at National Harbor. There's some showers off to the north and west and wouldn't be surprised to see a few sprinkles come through pretty quickly here. We've got showers being reported at Dulles, 50 degrees, mostly cloudy at Reagan National, 53, BWI, 52. So temperatures very cool, uh, only in the 40s and 50s as we are still under the influence of this uh, upper level low that has been driving down all this cold air. And it's only 48 in New York, 46 in Boston, 36 in Binghamton, 40 in Pittsburgh, and 48 in Chicago. Here's the effect of it on satellite and radar. You see how far south the clouds and showers stretch. And yes, snow showers across central West Virginia, the Laurel Highlands in Pennsylvania, upstate New York. So cold enough for it at those highest elevations. Here's your band of showers 
showers moving from northwest to southeast. So Futurecast has a passing shower through this evening, but then we will clear out overnight. We'll start off with sunshine again Saturday, but the same thing will likely happen. Even though we start with sun, we'll get those afternoon clouds, maybe a passing shower. It's still very cool. It is warmer by Sunday, not by a lot, but I think having a full day of sun, less wind, and temperatures slightly milder will start to make a difference. 55 on Saturday, 60 on Sunday, and should get warmer into Monday. By the way, the forecast for the solar eclipse, as you take a look at our future cloud cover, we're focused on D.C., of course, but also Buffalo, New York, where Mike will be in the path of totality, and both spots look pretty good. You want to see more greens and yellows when it comes to visibility. Buffalo may, bottle, may battle more cloud cover than us. Of course, you want it to be as clear as possible up in that path of totality, but for now, at least nothing stormy or anything that should totally get in the way. We'll talk more about that forecast coming up in my seven day. Shamari. Thank you, Caitlin. Still to come, spring football is back. I can't wait. We'll take you live to Audi Field as they prepare for the Defenders home opener. Oh, they're fired up. Yeah, and the Cavs are. getting ready to celebrate a big milestone for mm. one of their players. That's all ahead at five. We'll be right back.